possible to do that. So the name of the sermon is Defy Noble. Now, I don't know if you've heard this expression. I've never heard it before. It's called clarification comment. Now, where I heard it was this comedian was telling jokes, and sometimes, because people didn't understand the context, he had to put in a clarification comment. And, and he was telling this joke, a black comedian telling a joke about Nollywood. And my wife was looking at this as we printed it out, and she said, what's Nollywood? Well, he had to, when he told the joke about Nollywood, he had to put a clarification comment in. Because everybody's heard of Hollywood. And lots of people have heard of Bollywood, which is the Indian equivalent. And Nollywood is the African equivalent of Hollywood, where they produce all the films. Well, he had to put in a, and he said, this is systemic racism. You guys, you white people should know what Nollywood is, so I don't have to explain it and then ruin my joke. But the answer to that is, well, wait a minute. Um, you're th you are 13% of the population. You understand that some people aren't going to understand this. They're not. It, and we as Christians are 10 to 15% of the population. In 50, 1950, everyone understood that Jesus died on the cross. Jesus was God's son, and, and the only way of salvation was through Jesus. But that was 70 years ago, and people don't understand that anymore. They're not. And so you have to, you have to include a clarification comment. Uh, at Hillside Baptist, um, when I was there, they said, we're going to start a ministry called Sunshine Kids. S-O-N, shine, not S-U-N. It was Jesus. And so they... A lot of people said, I'd like my children to come to a daycare that's Christian-based, because then we know they're going to look after them. And the funny thing they discovered was, a lot of these children have never heard the stories of Jesus. They were, they were so thrilled to go home and say, did you know what Jesus did to their parents? And the point was that Paul had to do this every new place he went. He had to explain stuff. There was a clarification comment. Well, Jesus was the son of David, the promised Messiah. He had to do this every time. Because they didn't know anything about it, or very little, or the very little they knew was wrong. And he was okay with that. He was willing to work under these conditions. He just wanted them to be open to the truth and understand that they have to learn this new stuff. Look at it and look at the proof so they could fairly and openly make up their own mind. He was looking for noble people. Now, noble is a, such a nice word. I, I, you think When you think of a noble person, that, that's a noble man. You think that he would be able to come and look after the women folk of a man, another man's house, and they would be safe, and they wouldn't take advantage of them. There was, if, if, if he was loaned, if you loaned a noble person your property, it would come back in good working order and clean and better condition than it left. I was thinking about the, the, um, the rioters in the last three months. No one has ever called them noble. Those noble rioters who are burning Walmart down. No, they haven't. They haven't called them that. There's a, uh, in history, 700 years ago, they had what they called the Holy Wars. And men of, would, would go to the, go to the wars. And the problem was, of course, is that you would get these people that had no gainful employment, and they gathered together and say, let's go, go to war, we'll make our fortune. They were called soldiers of fortune. And the community um, had a great big um, send-off for them because one is they were the ones that were doing the crime in the, in the community and they, they were all happy to see them go. 
They knew that they probably wouldn't make it to Israel before they were hung in some other city, but these were not noble people. They um, rampaged and raped the whole way there. They weren't noble. I have a, a great story about this. I always like this movie. It's a noble, noble character. It's called Lilies of the Field. And the story is Sidney Poitier um, was traveling. He was a kind of a handyman and he was traveling along. He stopped in front of these nuns' place and to put water in his radiator. And they asked him to fix the roof. And he expected some money for it. And, and he was opening his Bible, which I thought was great in the movie. He was opening his Bible and he was reading words and it said, a, a, a man is worthy of, a, a workman is worthy of his hire. So he would prove to her from the Bible. And she said, um, the lilies of the field neither reap nor sow, but God looks after their needs. And, and, and you can tell that every time they went and turned, he was losing so he ended up relenting and not being paid for the, all the work he'd done fixing the roof. But when she saw him, she said, God has sent me a strong man to build my chapel. And so she told him. And he said, no, 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 I'm not going to do this. But what I'll do is I'll carry the heavy beams over so you guys can do it yourself. And... and the movie goes on, he relents and relents and he relents. He's too noble to not say, to, to, to not say no. And I thought, well, you see, he was, he was a, a noble man. Now the Bible is full of stories about noble characters. And so I'm going to spend a couple minutes and tell you about some noble characters. The first one I'd like to tell you about is Job. Job was a noble character, and um, his three friends had told him he was the worst sinner in the entire world. And in Job 42, verse 8, <clears throat> um, it says, God is saying this to his three friends who had been so mean to Job. Now therefore take for yourself seven bulls and seven rams and go to my servant Job and offer up a burnt offering for yourself and my servant Job will pray for you for I will accept him so that I may not do with you according to your folly because you have not spoken to me what is right as my servant, David, as my servant Job did. Now here's the funny thing and I, I read this and read this again and said, you know, God never cleared this with Job. God never said to Job, you know those friends that were awfully mean to you? I'm going to send them to you and you're going to pray for them so that they will not be harmed by me. And so they just showed up. They showed up with the seven rams and the seven oxen or goats and whatever. And they, I want, we, God sent us to, for you to pray for us. Well, he didn't know they were coming, but he did the noble thing and prayed for them. And then it says, because if he did, God gave him back everything he had. Now, there's some people that don't start out noble, but when, when they have to make a choice, they choose something noble. Here's a, in Genesis uh, 38, 24, 26, this is Judah. Now, you have to understand, Judah is one of the 12 sons of Israel, the 12 sons of Jacob, and he gave Tamar to his first son. And the Bible says that his first son was wicked, and God killed him. And then, as was custom, he gave his, his Tamar to his second son, and he was also wicked, and God killed him. And now the third, he says, I, you wait, you go back to your parents' house, and when my third son is old enough, I will give you to him. But Judah was not any too inclined to give his third son to Tamar, because he thought he would get killed too. He lost two sons to this wife. 
this woman. And so Tamar says, I'll take this into my own hands. And she knew that Judah was coming. She pretended to be a prostitute. He hired her as a prostitute. And three months later, she was pregnant. And this is what it says in verse 24. Now it was about the third month later that Judah was informed, your daughter-in-law Tamar has played the harlot, and behold, she is also with child by harlotry. Then Judah said, bring her out and let her be burned. It was while she was being brought out that she sent to her father-in-law, saying, I am with child by the man to whom these things belong. And, and she said, Please examine these and see whose signet ring and cords and staff these are. Judah recognized them and said, She is more righteous than I, insomuch as I did not give her to my son, Shelah. What happened was, he was confronted with the fact that he had did this with her, and instead of hiding it, he was noble enough to say that I am guilty of this sin, she is more righteous than I am. There was a third group, um, they were called the Rechabites. And I thought, I, I've been reading Jeremiah, but in Jeremiah 35, verse 6, it talks about the Rechabites. Now the Rechabites had been told, um, Rechab was this ancestor of the Rechabites. They, they, they were named after him. Rechab is the, the name for Rechabites. It's, they just add that abides to it. But anyway, he had said, I have seen how Israel is becoming wealthy and they're abandoning God. So as a family, we will not ever live in a house. We will not ever have uh, grow grapes and have a vineyard and we will never drink wine for all of the generations to follow. And so God says to Jeremiah, you call the Rechabites who were in Jerusalem at that time because of invading armies and said, you bring them to the temple and you put wine before them. And this is what happened. 38, 24, no, sorry, Jeremiah 35, 6. 35, 6 says this. Then I set before the man of the house of the Rechabites pitchers full of wine and cups. And I said to them, drink wine. And they said, we will not drink wine, for Joadad, the son of Rechabite, Rechab, our father, commanded us, saying, you shall not drink wine, you are your sons forever, and you shall not build a house, and you shall not sow seeds, and you shall not plant a vineyard or own one, but in tents you shall dwell all your days, and you shall live many days in the land that you sojourn. God recognized them as noble people, noble men and families, and he used them as an example to illustrate to the rest of Israel, the rest of Judah, the rest of Jerusalem, how these people had honored the, the, the fa their father and honor God. And there's lots of examples of noble people and not so noble people throughout the Bible. And that's where we come to this <coughs> passage about the people in the synagogue in Berea. And it's the only example where this happens in any synagogue that Paul went to. Usually when he went to a synagogue, people would, would, would well, maybe, and some people would believe and some people wouldn't, and usually he got chased out. Well, so let's look at the passage. Number one is dangerous, but this is the way we do it. In verse 10 it says, The brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. And when they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. Now, when you see that, you think, okay, they went by night and... It would be as if I left Moncton by night and came down here because I wasn't wanted in Moncton. It would be a, a, an hour drive, but these guys walked. So it may have been days, days and days before they got there. And it's just compressed. Anyway, this is what they did every time. They came and they spoke to the synagogue first. And, and usually it didn't go well. This is what 
Jeremiah was told by God every time, you're going to tell these people to repent, and they're not going to. You're going to tell them that this punishment is coming, and they're going to ignore you. And, <clears throat> and this was what was happening to Paul. In um, one of the things that Jeremiah, the first of Jeremiah says, you will be like a, bra a brass wall. People will be beat on you and not make a mark. But he didn't. He, it, God told him that they would never overcome him, but what he didn't say so much is that they were not going to be nice to you. In Jeremiah <clears throat> uh, 19, which I won't read, but I'll tell you the story is, God said, you go to the potter, and you buy a pot, and then you round up the leaders of the city of Jerusalem, and you take them outside the gate, and you smash that pot, and you tell them, this is what God's going to do to the people of Judah. He's going to smash you so that you can never be put back together. The pieces will be too small to ever assemble again. And this is what happened to him in verse 20, chapter 20. When Pashur, the priest, the son of Emar, who was the chief of the officers of the house of the Lord, heard Jeremiah prophesying these things, Pashur had Jeremiah the prophet beaten and put in stocks that were at the upper Benjamin gate, which is by the house of the Lord. <clears throat> you see, this is what Paul was doing. Every time he goes to the, the synagogue, and every time it would turn out badly, except this one time. There's, a, there's something called the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. It would be like I got the hammer and I put my thumb there and I hit the, my thumb with the hammer and that hurts something fierce. And I'll do it again, maybe it'll be different. And I'll hit it again and I'll... And they, what's always going to hurt, right? That's the definition of insanity. But it's also the definition of of obedience and the willingness, because that was what these, that's what Jeremiah was doing every time, every time, over and over again. But he was obeying. It's the, the definitions of faithfulness. Now, don't get me wrong, this is a good policy. It was a good policy for for Jer Jeremiah to obey the Lord. And, and we wouldn't have this book. If you remember, he wrote it all down. Or his helper wrote it all down and took it to the king. And the king read the page and put it in the fire. And he read another page and they wrote it all down again. And writing down a, 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 is not an easy thing to do. It's not like photocopying. Anyway. It was a good idea and a great policy, but it got negative results. It's like I, I, I was talking about the rioters earlier, but you might, might remember this. <clears throat> in Canada, in BC, there's a place called Clockwood, Clockwood Sound. I would pronounce it wrong, but it's, it's an area where they were going to, loggers were going to cut down all the trees, and there was a great amount of protest. And the loggers had filled out all the applications. It was all done correctly. This was all, but they stopped everything because of the protesters, and it went to court. And the court injunction was that the loggers continue, could continue to harvest these trees, and the rioters, not the rioters, the protesters could not come on site. They were barred. And so the rioters, the protesters, showed up, and they chain themselves to trees so that they couldn't harvest the trees. And so my answer to that is, okay, you, uh, you understand that these trees are so important that you're going to do this, but you have to understand that there will be consequences and you have to accept them as, and not complain. Well, the protesters were arrested and they were taken to court and they were given harsh sentences, maybe three months in prison, maybe a year of prison on the weekends. And 
and then a probation after that. And they screamed like, well, this is not right. But it was right. They knew in advance that if they did this, they would be arrested and punished. See, Paul and the others understood that there was a cost associated with going to the synagogue first, and they were willing to pay it. And they did pay it every time they came. Sometimes they were stoned. Sometimes they had to leave in the middle of the night, like in this case. They were sent off to Berea in the middle of the night from Thessalonica. The thing is, they were happy and willing to pay it as long as some of their Jewish brothers and sisters would join the faith. Number two is of more noble character. <clears throat> in verse 11 and 12 it says, Now those, these were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica, for they received the word with great eagerness and examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. Therefore, many of them believed, along with a number of prominent Greeks, women, and men. In Thessalonica, it says that Paul went for three Sabbaths and spoke, and some people came to faith, but mostly they hardened their heart against this message. And Paul and and his crew had done it often enough that this is what they would expect. <clears throat> it would be true. This is what would happen. But Berea was different. They met every day to study the scriptures to see if what they were being told was true. Can you imagine the average church? Um, families of young people, not all retired. And see, I'm not talking about retired people because no one retired in, in the time of this, unless you were rich. So these people would all come to church every day, and they would bring the young people, the kids, and, and my daughter has four little girls, and sometimes it's a job to keep four little girls sitting in the seat and, and obeying. And so I could see children being held by their mother and, and being older children holding their younger brothers and sisters so that they would be quiet. And, and the children had a vested interest because this is the first time they'd ever seen their parents so enthusiastic, so wanting to hear the scriptures. And if your parents are doing it, you want to be part of it. And on top of that, of course, the Holy Spirit would be drawing them and convicting their hearts. And somebody would sit, raise their hands in the air and say, Praise the Lord, what Paul said is correct. I've read it myself. I know the scripture, and, and it's right. Jesus is the Messiah. It's right here in Isaiah. They were having a revival. Well, number three is, <clears throat> you are too important to lose. Verse 13 to 15 said, When the Jews of Thessalonica found out that the word of God was being proclaimed by Paul and Berea also, they came there as well, agitating and stirring up the crowds. Then immediately, the brethren let, sent Paul out to go to, as far as the sea, and Silas and Timothy remained there. And when they had escorted Paul, brought him as far as Athens, and received a command for Silas and Timothy to come to him as soon as possible. And they left. Now, this has all the appearance of a group of men in women and families that have heard all the stories of how Paul has been mistreated and they don't want that to happen in their city. They don't want this, the, that, that candle of salvation to be snuffed out in the small town of Berea. So they want to make sure that they, and, and they don't send them, just send them away. They don't point to the road and say go. They take him with them. And it says they took them as far as the sea. Now, as I was studying this, I found that there was a scholarly disagreement as to what happened when he reached the sea. Some people think that he went by sea, like out this way, and then back around to Athens. And some people think he went the shore route, and it just, it's, it's explained this way so that he'll go to the sea, and then he's got two options. Which way does he go? If you're trying to, Thessalonica is trying to find him, he's, the, which way? Now, I looked in the back of my Bible, and it shows that on his second missionary journey in green, 
He went by sea in his third missionary journey. He went from Berea to Athens by land. But really, it's unimportant. That's one of those unimportant things. We know he went. Which way did he go? Plane, train, or airplane? Or, or car? We don't know. But it doesn't matter. <clears throat> now, some people uh, take people's words for it. Even if it doesn't make sense, then they don't even ask if it makes sense. They just say, okay, whatever. Now, this is, this is a science thing. And people take the word of, of scientists that, that say, the reason we know the world is billions of years old is the rock layers are laid down like this. And over years and years and years, more rock layers accumulate. And, and that's how we know how old the Earth is. And they said that uh, if you go to the Grand Canyon, there's going to be a sign that says the Grand Canyon is 6,000 feet deep. And it's 2 billion years of life's history. The world's history is in that 6,000 feet. So I did the math, and 3 and a half inches, 3.6 inches, is 100,000 years. So... Anyway, what happens is the stuff hardens to rock. And so you could ask the question, okay, that's... Uh, but I was in, in Alberta, and I was driving along the road, and I could see these flat rock layers, and they looked like ribbon candy. They're just like that. It's amazing. How did, how did these flat layers of rock accumulate, hundreds of feet accumulate and, and bend. Well, the only possible answer is, well, you, they, they didn't accumulate over 33 million years. They accumulated in a day or a couple days, and they were soft and titanic, tectonic action squished them, and, and they just went like, like that. Like when you put a shirt in your drawer and you crunch it up and then I bought a shirt at Frenchies because we, I bought this nice tie. But anyway, it had been crunched so much that it was like three sizes smaller because of the wrinkles. The point is, you can say it's not true. It can't be true that this hardened into rock and then didn't break to pieces when somebody bent it. The second thing you could say is um, radiocarbon dating. is, And there's five different carbon dating things that will tell you, they'll take a rock and they'll say this is 68 million years old. So somebody came up with this idea, well let's take a rock, I'll go get one from the driveway, and we'll send it off, and we'll pay the money, and they'll carbon date it, or whatever it is, they'll, uh, they'll date it, argon dating, and, and what should happen is you should send this to five different places, and five different testing things, and, and they'll all come back the same within a, a margin of error. But the, so this person, these people, took a rock, split it in five, sent it off. And they knew the rock was 20 years old, because rock forms all the time. It just needs the right conditions. And this 20-year-old rock came back at hundreds of thousands of years old and millions of years old. And you've got to say, well, how can people believe this? And well, they believe it because they want to. No one wants to find out, they just it accepts it. Well, <clears throat> the Bereans weren't this type of people. They were noble, and more than that, they wanted to discover the truth for themselves. And we can choose to follow their example. I was um, reading Timothy. Tim, 2 Timothy 2.15 says this. Be diligent to present yourself and prove to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed accurately handling the word of truth. Paul is telling Timothy he needs to be a workman. This, this You can't do this in 25 or 35 minutes on a Sunday. Once a week, unless you're doing something else more important, you cannot be a workman. You have to study God's word like the Bereans did. Now, fortunately... You have one of these at home. You have maybe two of them at home, and you can study God's Word for you. You don't have to come and bring the children 
and then sit on your knee and try to keep them quiet while you study God's words. You can do it at home. See, Paul brought this new information that he said was Jesus is the Messiah that his, the Jews have been waiting for so long. And it was prophesied in the scriptures, and they could have accepted it, or they could have done what they did and verified it for themselves. When they did, they could say, I know what God said, and it's true, because I read it myself. You see, there's lots of people who are out to redefine what the Bible says, to redefine what God says, and most of it's heresy. And how do you divide the truth from the lie? Well, you have to do the work. It's the same as when I said that the, the, these 200 feet of, 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 of rock is all bent up and, and there's no cracks in it. How did that happen? Well, the person has to say, well, it, it didn't form over three, 33 billion years and hardened the rock and then got bent. No, it bent, but it was soft. You do the same thing with the teaching of every, any religious leader. You say to him, well, I, I hear what you're saying. I'm going to verify it with the Bible. And if what the Bible says and what you say are different, then I'm going to have to say that you got it wrong. We have to part ways here if you continue to speak heresy. Now, do you remember I said about the the map that says they, Paul went to Athens this way by sea or this way by land? Well, there's lots of things in the Bible that we'll never know. And they're unimportant. And, and they're not the thing I'm talking about. It's the thing that we sang in this hymn. One day, let me read it. Living, he loved me. Dying, he saved me. Buried, he carried my sins far away. Rising, he justified freely forever. One day is coming, a glorious day. If if you can't, if, if they're saying, well, that's not true, then you have to say, wait a minute. I read this clearly. It, Paul said this. It says this in the scriptures. It says that he did all of these things for me. And so I'm going to have to agree to disagree with you and let you go your way. There's, you have to pick what's important and what's not important. I'm not going to get in an argument over did the Bereans send Paul by sea or by land? It's not like the, the guy that uh, in the U.S. Revolution that uh, one, one light by the sea and one light by land or two everywhere. The point is we have to pick the ones that are important and we have to do the work to know which ones those are. And when you do that, you can say, I know whom I have believed in, and am persuaded that he is able to keep back which I have committed unto him against that day. 